Aloha, I'm Chad Ford, and you're listening to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board on the Locked On Podcast Network. Look who my guest is. It's David Thorpe from Clearwater, Florida. Clearwater, F- Florida, and a and true prominent hoop. writer <laughs> at True Hoop. Yes. All right, here we go. New cool video intro. The Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. There it is, David. That's big time. That was awesome. Big time intro. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> we made it to the big leagues um, right now. <laughs> All right. I'm your host, Chad Ford. You are listening to our NBA Big Board podcast. We're streaming live on YouTube now. And I got to tell you about on Thursday, we are doing live talk. I got Rafael Barlow, John Corrales. We're going to have all the locked in hosts. We're going to be here doing the entire draft live. Go over to the Locked On NBA channel. We're going to stream it through YouTube. We're in a professional studio. I'm actually in Dallas today uh, getting ready for that. We're going big time with this. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm so excited to have one of the funnest guests I could possibly have. We're just a couple of days away from the draft. It's David Thorpe. We worked together for years at ESPN. He's now over at True Hoop. So he's got his own Substack thing going on just like me um, with my other good friend, Henry Abbott. It's like a little bit of a reunion. We used to talk draft all the time. It's been a while. Uh, David's been reaching out to me the last couple of days, giving me some ideas on some of his prospects. I'm like, hey, you got to come on the show. We're going to have fun together. And I want to go back and actually start this relationship because it's a really cool relationship. We met when you were out really doing training and preparing prospects for the NBA draft and training some in NBA players. And and I just fell in love with you as a coach and your enthusiasm and your charisma and how much you cared uh, about the prospects and about the game. And uh, I, I sort of recruited you to ESPN. Oh, and there's no sort of about it. So, so first of all, Chad, uh, I was texting you when I first was starting to train pros. Like my first pros were in 1999. Uh, I didn't start doing really draft players till 2004. But in between there, I had been. I got your phone number probably from an agent, and uh, and or maybe I was emailing you probably at first. I doubt I was even texting. And you would never respond to any of my emails, which is fair. I was nobody. I, mean, I was well known in my area coaching, but I wasn't known in the national scene. I had no great players. And then out of the blue, you hit me up one time and you, we became immediate friends because you're an amazing person. And, and I've much, I very much valued what you did, your role you had at ESPN for the draft. And years later, it's one of my favorite compliments of all time. I said to you once, we're having a meal together. And I said, like, Chad, why did you suddenly reach out to me? And at this point, we'd already talked a thousand minutes together when I, I could never get you on the phone at first. And you said, David, I'm an attorney. I, I had this crazy guy from Florida sending me draft notes about players. And I didn't know who you were. You were saying some pretty outlandish things, but I wrote everything down. And you told me I stumbled upon your notes one day a couple years later. And I started reading my notes from what your comments, and I'm like, God, this guy actually isn't lying about stuff. Uh, he's pretty smart. I should be in touch with him. So then we became friends. I started training some good players like Kevin Martin in the 2004 draft, and you greatly helped his draft stock because you came to a private workout we did in Chicago that he did extremely well in, uh, was well attended. And so that's when things really kicked off, kicked off between you and I. And then, Chad, you told me in 2007 – that there was ESPN was trying to hire some inside basketball guys. And I started my own blog with for no reason other than I like to write. And by the goodness of your heart, you told our great editors, Royce Webb and Chris Ramsey, you know what? I know you're interviewing like Jeff Weltman got hired and I did you because of you. I did three interviews all a hundred percent because of you. And you said, you don't, you told those guys, you don't have to hire a former exec. And quite frankly, whoever you do hire as a former exec wants to get back to being an executive. Thorpe has his own thing going on. He isn't going to be thinking about maybe if I say the wrong thing or write the wrong thing, he won't get 
hired, he doesn't want to work in the NBA, which is true. So we were there 10 years together with Mark Stein and John Hollinger. It's reunion week this week for you. I listened to your last two pods. And I don't know that anyone really appreciates, other than those of us inside, what a family we were. Like we were teammates and partners, all of us that worked at ESPN with Brian and everyone that was there and Henry, of course. Uh, It's a big list. Uh, We treat each other like brothers and sisters and always had each other's backs and always helped. Stein and I were on the phone till 2 a.m. many times, and he doesn't live in Hawaii. (laughs) So we were very close. So it's, uh, of course, as soon as I heard you were doing this, I couldn't wait to subscribe, and and I'm really thrilled to be on your show. Well, I really appreciate it. And it was actually talking to David and Henry that got me going on the idea of doing a newsletter. They had already uh, started a really cool newsletter, True Hoop, uh, that you can go check out uh, at Substack. It's unique. That's what I'll say about True Hoop. It's a very unique take in storytelling and digging deep and investigative journalism on the NBA and just a great podcast. So much great work from David and and Henry, and you know, it it sort of feels like now that Mark Stein's back, and you know, we're kind of going to get the get the gang back together somehow, yeah. some way. And I, and I, I just feel it because it, there was you're right, this camaraderie that was there. Now we're probably boring all of our listeners at this point, <laughs> and they're like, we don't care about any of that. Just tell us who the Pistons are going to take in the draft, right. and you know, that's fair enough. But I, I just want to set this up. Okay, why David Thorpe? Because look, there's a lot of different ways to scout the draft and you have, you know, professional NBA scouts, you have executives, you have former players, but you, David comes from the standpoint of a coach, but a coach who is preparing young players to be in the NBA. And then after they got in the NBA, how to improve their games and become better in the NBA. And I think that that provides a very unique set of experiences and lenses upon which to look at these players. He has been around young players his whole life as they're preparing for the NBA. He knows what to look for. He knows all sorts of little things that he sees in players that are going to translate and that don't translate. Like everybody who does draft analysis, David doesn't get it always right, uh, just like anybody else. But David's story is true that after years of David telling me things about prospects and me keeping these notes – David was right way more than most NBA scouts were. And that's what part of the reason I wanted his voice at ESPN is it's a different voice. So I, and I hope that's what this podcast is going to be today. You are going to hear a different voice. That's why I love having John Hollinger uh, on the show, uh, you know, as well. And Raphael Barlow, who does video breakdowns and, and takes it from a different perspective. I want our listeners to not just hear the same thing every day on a podcast and not just hear the same thing from me because I have my own unique way of looking at this as well. And so we're going to, we're, we're, we're friends. So I doubt this is going to get heated, but I think it might get loud. Uh, we're going to do a, we're going to do a little mock draft war here and we are going to go through these, these mock drafts and look at, okay, what should the Pistons do and what have you. And David's going to have his own own take on this. And then I'll, I'll tell him mine and we're going to go through this together. And we're just going to have a good time because we're two days away from this draft. The Detroit Pistons are on the clock. Troy, Troy Weaver, who I think is an excellent GM and an excellent talent evaluator has the top pick in the draft. David, everybody under the sun in Detroit is pushing Troy Weaver. You have no choice. There's only one prospect here. It's Cade Cunningham. Don't screw this up. This is an obvious, uh, this is a softball slow pitch towards you just hit it out of the park. You've been analyzing all these guys. And by the way, I don't know what David's going to say right now. You've been analyzing all of these guys. You've been watching them. Is it a no-brainer, Cade Cunningham, number one? Is that the guy you would take if you were Troy Weaver for the Detroit Pistons with a number one pick? Nope. No, but I I like I like him very much. I, I think you're right. I think he's, they're likely going to take him. Uh, I love Dwayne. Uh, Coach Casey's a friend of mine and terrific. Um, I think Troy's great. I've, I've had Troy in my gym before. He's very smart. Very, you know, the process. I heard you and uh, John talking about uh, the process the Pistons have taken. Of course, they should be taking this process, right? Of course, you should slow down and evaluate. But he's. I have him third on my list for guys that I'm most excited about. And I'm happy to go into detail later as, as we talk about what it is and how I rank them. But I'm happy to tell you who I would take number one. All right, uh, let's hear it. And we'll get we'll get yeah. to Cade later when we get, I guess, to number yeah. three. Yeah. Uh, but let's let's go ahead and let's unveil. The Detroit Pistons have the number one pick in the draft. 
David Thorpe selects Evan Mobley from USC. Evan yeah. Mobley yeah. from USC, who's number two on my big board. Yeah. And yeah, I, it's and not I a big stretch. Along, the gap isn't isn't big. Right. right. Tell me why Evan Mobley, in your opinion, is the right pick for the Pistons with the number so, two. So when I'm watching this kind of thing, all I'm really doing, Chad, is 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 your project. I'm projecting, as most of us are, how these guys impact wins. It, it, I don't know what any other way to look at it because I'm not behind the scenes on the financial side of things, right? So, so maybe Damian Lillard or someone that can play like Damian Lillard can make your franchise more money. But I don't know those metrics. I know basketball metrics. So, uh, uh, Mobley to me reminds me most of a right hand, almost a mirror image of Chris Bosh. Right? I don't think I'm unique in saying that. Right? Seven feet longer than that wingspan, super agile, super athletic, has more skill than Chris had at that age. He can't shoot yet, but he looked at Chris at Georgia Tech after his freshman year. Uh, but when, when and when Chris was at Toronto, I thought he was an MVP caliber talent that was ascending. Had he stayed in Toronto, I think there was a chance he could have been. It's not very likely, but he was in that realm. And then he went to Miami, and of course, it's all about LeBron to a little bit Dwayne Wade, right? But Chris Bosh was a plus-minus monster. All right. And the metrics showed he was the best pick and roll defender pretty much in the world. Let's just say the NBA, but that means pretty much the world. Bosch allowed the Heat to play really fast on defense because he was able to play the five. And that game was different than this game. So when you look at, for example, the Bucks Suns, this last series, in the last three games, Phoenix shot 23, 19, and 25 threes. They averaged 35 plus in the regular season. After they went 20 of 40 in game two, all right, they shot, I think, 30 in, in maybe game three. And then the last three, the way the Bucs can protect the rim with Lopez and Portis and Giannis and get out and extend them from the perimeter and force them to do nothing mostly but Booker buckets in the paint. I call it the second box, the middle of the, of the paint, not the rim. And Chris Paul, of course, and just those contested twos. That was by design. And so if you've got Evan Mobley on your team, with how stretched out defenses are now with shooters and athletes, a guy that can cover as much ground as he can. You're talking about potential defensive player of the year. Think about the top two defenders this year on the metrics I use at dunksandthrees.com. You have Rudy Gobert and Matisse Tabuel, number one and two in the league in defense. Well, they both their teams won their conferences, right? Then, then you have Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, obviously, on, on Philadelphia side. Rudy's just way better than everybody. I think this kid can be an un, this young man can be an unbelievable defensive presence, pick and roll jumps to 13 feet, rim racer in transition. He blocks shots with both hands very comfortably, which is not something you see. So even if he doesn't develop, Chad, an amazing half court game, I think he has a huge impact on wins and losses for a team. And I also like how he pairs with the young Pistons players, but that's less relevant to me. He, I think, is the most likely star that also has the highest floor in the draft. All right. Look, that's not a crazy take. Mm. Uh, you know, the analytics folks have have been saying saying this for a bit. Uh, it's been interesting that if you hear a, another name in Detroit, it's Jalen Green, not Evan Mobley. I think because of the star power, J- Jalen Green's yeah. a very sexy, yeah. sexy prospect, and I can see why people want him there. So I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute because yeah. I, I I like Evan Mobley. Uh, here's the one thing that. I want to hear your opinion about, because I think as a coach and as a guy who trains, this matters a lot to you. If there's one thing that I hear sometimes from scouts is his motor doesn't run particularly hot, that there was questions, especially in high school about how hard he was playing. He seemed disinterested at times. There's been little rumblings from scouts around that this is not the the killer that Cade Cunningham or Jalen Green or Jalen Suggs is as far as just this drive and passion to win. Yeah. When you hear that uh, as, as a coach, does that, does that scare you? Can that be taught? Are you not that concerned about that? And, and I don't know how big a deal it is uh, because I don't think people are raising it to a monumental level. Uh, but I, I think it's something that people will whisper this is a difference between Mobley and Suggs and Green and 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 Cunningham. What what's your what's your response to that? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a great question to ask. I'll got I'll give you two quick things. 
I saw Amari Stoudemire play in high school. He played my alma mater, which at that year, the tallest kid was six foot two, and every kid was as slow as you or me right now. <laughs> and Amari jogged everywhere. And I, I remember thought, this. Yeah. I, I just thought, I mean, I know exactly where I was with a, a dear friend of mine, a Hall of Fame level coach in high school. I said, How does this guy think he can play in the NBA? I didn't understand the NBA then. This was before I was involved. And then, of course, he's rookie of the year and is one of the best centers I've ever seen that wasn't really a center. He was bored. He was bored. So now flash forward to 2020, 2019, and I'm watching LaMelo Ball play in the NBL. And not only is he not trying on defense at all, and I wrote about this pretty well, pretty famously, because I was pretty hard on him. He was cleaning his sneakers with his hands during possessions. But this guy didn't care one bit about anything but looking good on offense. But I watched LaMelo Ball this year very closely. I still have major questions about his defense for sure, but not about his competitiveness. There's no doubt of that. So I think Mobley is so talented. I can't imagine in high school he, he was pushed much at all. He's so, he's so much better than almost every guy. And this is where Dwayne Casey comes in. This is where management and coaching comes in. Uh, uh, the easy thing is in this league, you get destroyed if you don't compete. So if he has no pride, I'd be worried. But I haven't seen that. You don't block three shots a game. He, he was sixth in the country in block shots amongst all shot blockers in college. But number one amongst the bigger schools, the schools that are playing for rings, in a sense, for titles. So you're playing against better competition. He had three blocks a game as a freshman. No no tape watching, which we'll talk about. You talked about this, Hollander, too. With COVID, it's so hard for these guys to – it's unfair to really judge this class, period, because it was so limited in what they could do, so restricted. So I'm not worried about his motor one bit. Um, I I understand why people are, but given what I've seen, too many of these guys who are just so much better than people, as long as he has pride, he'll be just fine. All right, so we just started off the podcast with a bang there. Coach Thorpe taking Evan Mobley, number one, to the Detroit Pistons. I have Kate Cunningham going there. Yeah. My listeners have heard it ad nauseum. <laughs> I've been attacked, uh, was attacked on Detroit radio the other day for even suggesting that the gap wasn't close. I also like the fit of Jalen Green there as well. And I like the fit of Evan Mobley, one of the one of the concerns that I have about Cunningham and Detroit is that this is their young core. I'm not talking about their entire team, but their young yeah. core isn't particularly athletic. Uh, Sadiq Bay, Killian Hayes, uh, Isaiah Stewart, right. adding adding an elite athlete when there's two of them sitting there up up on top of the board. Uh, we're really three with Scotty Barnes as well, yeah. or maybe four even with Jonathan Kaminga, and taking the one guy that that isn't particularly athletic. Um, it is something that raises eyebrows. I think Kid Cunningham is going to be great. I think it's certainly a defensible pick for Troy Weaver to take him. But if he took Evan Mobley at one, uh, I'd high five the guy. If nothing else, for the courage uh, to do it. Same, same if they took Jalen Green. Okay. So that's Detroit at one. At number two, the Houston Rockets set on the board now. Cade Cunningham is there, but David Thorpe's already given it away nope. that he doesn't have Cade Cunningham number two on his board either. And so here's the moment of truth. Yeah. Is this Jalen Green? Is this Jalen Suggs? Or is this Scotty Barnes? I'm taking Barnes. And, and I have Scotty to- Scotty Barnes, here we go. I have to preface it, and you know this well, my son plays on the team. So- I have an unfair advantage of not only watching every millisecond Scotty Barnes played this year. I also live in Florida. I saw him win a championship when he was at university. I, I, I followed him a little bit at Montverde with Cade. Not a lot. I don't really follow it that much. But I watched his entire season at Florida State. I know what's, I know inside baseball un, unfairly. Not that my son spoke out of turn, but I would just – I have told you this story where, you know, week and a half into practice – he and I talked pretty much after every practice. I said, how'd it go today? He said, we had a first bad practice today. I said, what happened? And he said, well, Scotty twisted his ankle slightly, and so they held him out. And daddy's just our leader. He's the loudest guy on the court. You can't have a bad practice with him. And I think I may have even told you this story when, when I told you about Florida State and Barnes. I saw Troy Aikman, Chad, cry. I literally watched Troy Aikman from the Cowboys cry in an interview when he was being inducted to the Hall of Fame, talking about Michael Irvin, who's a Florida boy that I, I went to school with people that played high school with him when I was in college. And he said, Troy Aikman said, you don't understand. We never had a bad practice my entire career with the Cowboys because of Michael Irvin. If we were rolling, he kept us grounded and focused. If we were struggling, he lifted us up. And that's the best way. I, that is so incredibly valuable 
to a franchise, to a program. Scotty, he, he just well, you've heard this, I'm sure, now in Chicago. He can't help but cheer. He doesn't care who gets the successful play. He's the loudest guy on the floor. He loves to defend. And so now let's talk about the Rockets, a atro- an atrocious defensive team. They're it's best just an possible. atrocious team, but yes. Right, okay. right. Fair. <laughs> right, you're right. They're bad on both sides. So, so Christian Wood, I like very much. Uh, every, people seem excited about Kevin Porter Jr., right? Uh, he ranked in the first percentile of defense this year, seventh last year. That means he was in the, 99% of the league was better than him on defense. Scotty Barnes walks in, not as a great defensive player, but as a projected player that can guard five spots. I know you've talked about this. I witnessed it. I witnessed him get low and clap guarding point guards 90 feet from the rim. He doesn't always stay in front of them. He's six foot nine, pretty much with a seven foot wingspan. He stays connected. His feet are great. He changes speeds and direction for a gigantic man very well. He jumped nearly 40 inches. And remember, these guys haven't had a season of uh, on court performance work because of COVID. He changed positions. He played with Cade Cunningham, so he wasn't a primary ball handler at Montverde. He played a lot of point guard for Florida State, but no extra work, no extra work on his shooting because of the restrictions of COVID. He couldn't get in a film room with those great coaches at Florida State and study anything because of COVID. To me, he's got, I told you this on the phone the other day, a super high floor because if he doesn't learn to shoot, he's still a very good all-around impact player, but I think he is going to learn to shoot. And I told you, I think he's got a mid-range game that he doesn't know how to utilize yet, but when he did, it was very effective. I think he's got a little Kawhi Leonard in him. He's not the guy I think he's most like. I think he's more like a Pippen and a Draymond Green. I actually made another note too. Um, guys that uh, you know, guys that just do lots of little things. I think he he's that guy, uh, and I think he's going to be an incredible, incredible player and potentially like a first team All NBA player. All right. So for all the listeners who have said Chad Ford is the leader and the head of the parade of the Scotty Barnes fan club, or sometimes John Hollinger, who has him number three on his board, meet David Thorpe, who has him number two and knows him better than just about anybody else. And so let's, I'm going to push back now. Yeah, go ahead. Because this is the thing that I think is going to, you're, you're going to hear back. I've heard back. How can you justify taking a guy at number two when you're talking about little things, glue guy, defense, when you have Jalen Green sitting there who could be a 25-point-a-night scorer? You got Cade Cunningham who plays the most coveted position in the NBA and, and is shooting 40% from three and all of those things like that. Those guys are stars. When people describe Scotty Barnes, it almost sounds like Scotty Pippen, like we're talking about, or Draymond Green, like we're talking about a guy who absolutely impacts winning. Absolutely, you see why he's vital to your team. But is that the guy that you take it to when you have these other prospects, again, like Jalen Green, like Cade Cunningham, who have this so, such a high ceiling as offensive players? So that that's, I think, the the pushback on Barnes and then of course the shooting thing, which you've already addressed. So we'll move on from, from that. I mean, obviously pe- t- people are worried about that. Yeah. And fairly enough. And and he, the way he shoots it well in college uh, uh, is concerning. He looks like Ben Simmons shooting the ball. When you're that long limbed and long fingered and big hand, uh, it is really hard as, as a, t- as a shooting coach for 30 years now, those are the hardest guys to teach for sure. But I mean, I've had 80 plus NBA players. Plenty of them look like Scotty lengthwise and learned to shoot. Um, and plenty of guys in the NBA have learned to shoot. Uh, I, I'll be honest, I just can't see one side of the ball. Th- this is a two sided game. Defensive teams win often and win championships. Uh, Frank Vogel changed the Lakers into a defensive first team. And they might have won a second ring this year had they not had the injuries they had. They were leading the league in defense again. It's pretty amazing. Uh, I'm a big believer in that other side of the court. I'm also I'm also not all caught up in just scoring. And this is not about Cade. I'll talk about Jalen Green when I get to him, which is pretty soon. I, I think he's a terrific talent, very, very special talent. But he doesn't know how to play. And it's not all his fault. The G League system, I thought, this year was really bad for those guys. I feel bad for him Kaminga. We'll talk more about that later. Scotty Barnes really knows how to play. 
And the downside of those guys that have all this talent, uh, Chad, athletically and skill, but don't know how to put it together. Like Zach Levine is still learning how to win basketball games. His athleticism is off the charts. You're not going to tell me Jalen Green is more athletic than Zach Levine, and you can't tell me he, he's more skilled. Zach Levine can really handle it, pass it, and shoot it, but he can't win yet. It's really hard to learn those little things. So, again, if you're asking me who can sell the most tickets and be exciting, Scotty Barnes isn't the answer in terms of points and highlights. But I'm trying to draft players that can help my franchise have a chance to win a franchise, have a chance to win a championship. And there's more to it than just scoring. And so that's why I lean to Barnes on that. I don't think the other guys are bad picks. Uh, it's, it's certainly Cunningham, but I lean give, towards Barnes. Give me, give me a, a optimistic and then a pessimistic view of what his offensive output would look like in average, you know, when he's five years into the league. What's, what's an yeah, optimistic I, view of what Scotty Barnes is going to be averaging on offense? And then what's a pessimistic view? Five years in. Well, so I'll do it. I'll do it this way. Uh, I think he's the most Giannis like player in this draft. Giannis, no one could have projected Giannis to look the way he did when he was 18 years old. All right. Scotty's a better ball handler than Giannis was at this age. He was a better passer. I think they're equally competitive. I think Giannis was slightly more athletic and more fluid. And ironically, Giannis was a better shooter. Giannis shot better his first year. I think his gigantic shoulders possibly have jacked up his shot a little bit, right? Uh, but this guy can be a combination of Giannis and Scottie Pippen. Draymond, if you watch Team USA the other night, Draymond defensively was unbelievable. Scottie's going to be a better player than Draymond without question. And I think a very similar impact defensively, which means defensive player of the year. So I think it's much more like a Scottie Pippen type where he could get to 18, 20 points a game, especially if it's fast pace. He's terrific in transition. He's got to learn to focus on what I call the second box mid-range jumper, which is 14, 15, 12 feet, 11 feet in the paint. If the right program does that, I think he'll become a high-level scorer. And I don't care if he's the best player or not, but he won't care either, and that's the other point. He'll just want to win. So if he's the second best, look at Chris Bosh as a third best player. They went to four straight finals. Le LeBron uh, needed something like that on that team. I think Scotty has a chance to be that kind of impactful player. All right. Well, look, I love this. And these are the exactly type of the reasons I brought you on, uh, you know, having those intimate knowledge, being able to tell those stories, you know, this is all stuff that people miss. And, and one of the reasons I talk to people like David and as part of my background, some of it doesn't ever end up in my articles because there's certain things that guys just don't want on the record. It's too easy to tell who it came from or whatever. But this is the sort of information I'm collecting that I, I think is so interesting and valuable. I had Evan Mobley going to uh, to the Rockets. I did have Scotty Barnes going three to the Cavs, which uh, caused quite an uproar uh, in Cleveland uh, when, when I did so. Um, good news for the Cav Cavs fans. Uh, he's not on the board uh, and neither is Evan Mobley. And so I'm assuming this is where uh, you see Cade Cunningham three to the Cleveland yeah. Cavaliers. Yeah, I love him. I love, I listen, I love Scotty for the Cavs as it probably works out that he'll be available at three in the real draft. Uh, I, I love him at four next to Okoro and their guards. No, they'll, they're probably going to trade uh, the Alabama kid, right? They're probably going to trade Sexton is Colin what we Sexton, think. Yeah. I like Garland a lot. Uh, I love Cade with Garland because it allows it allows that backcourt to play together. And there's nothing wrong with two ball handlers. Uh, every team needs primary ball handlers, two, three, four of them. And and Cade can guard the two and allow Garland to strictly guard the one. Obviously, they'll be switching all of that. I really like that combination. I'm I'm a big fan of Cade. I I just don't think he's got like to me he's a he's a taller. Well, I, I look at him two ways. I think he's a primary ball handler version of Jason Tatum, which is amazing. But I don't think he's got Tatum scoring instincts. I might be wrong. Like it's okay to if I'm, I'm I've watched him a lot of, on a lot of tape. There's certain ways Tatum scored at that age that Cade struggled with. Uh, that doesn't mean he can't learn to do it by any stretch. Like the, we needs to go hang out with Drew. Needs to go hang out with Drew Hanlon. Uh, who yeah. who works who works endlessly right. with Jason Tatum on right. on that sort of stuff? Those yeah. things are really important. Uh, uh, you know me; I, I'm a player development guy. I've been doing this for a long time, and I've watched Ted Lasso. That's a real thing. It's a fake show, but it's a real thing. You can Ted Lasso these guys, right? You can cajole them into developing their game more and believing more. Uh, Drew Holiday is a guy that has never been comfortable as a scorer, and it hurt him in the finals. They ended up winning Game Six. But not because he was a comfortable scorer. He only had two decent scoring games. He really struggled. 
He likes to be the quarterback. I think Chris Paul, too much in his career, has been more of the quarterback. I I see Cade more as the franchise, you know, the better Lonzo Ball. And Lonzo, Lonzo Ball is about to get paid. That is not an insult. I think Cade, I love Lonzo Ball coming out. So did you. I, I, did. I think he's better than Lonzo. So I think he's going to make a you know hundreds, 150, 200 million dollars. He is a can't miss. Anyone takes Kate Cunningham, they can't miss. But I don't, I just don't have him quite as as the ceiling as as other two guys. All right, that's really great, uh, great analysis. Look, we're already thirty minutes into the show and we've got through three picks, but that's why I love having David Thorpe on. Before we dive into the Toronto Raptors at four, let's talk about Rock Auto for a minute. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto with ever increasing numbers of makes and models. It's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questions and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts off their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why choose to spend 30, 50, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership? They have everything you need. Brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, and even new carpet. Go to rockauto.com right now. and See all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on. And they're how did you hear about us box. So they know we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Rockauto.com. My kids now know about rockauto.com. They've heard me say that so often now. They're like, <laughs> rockauto.com. It's uh... okay. Rockauto.com. Go get your parts there. We're talking with David Thorpe of True Hoop, uh, a longtime player development coach. And, you know, he just referenced Ted Lasso. And I just started la- laughing when he did it because I'm like, you know, you feel like, Ted Lasso is too good to be true. And and there's certain things about him that probably are. But when I watched the show the first time, I turned to my wife and I said, this guy reminds me of two people in my life I know. Uh, A man named Jim Farrell, uh, who's written some really cool books for the Arbinger Institute called The Anatomy of Peace and Leadership and Self-Deception and David Thorpe. Oh, wow. Uh, If you were to mix those two guys together... Um, this this is this is who I w- I would pick, especially your coaching style, the positivity, yeah. the upbeatness of this, the the caring about individuals uh, over necessarily winning. Uh, it's it's all there with with Coach Thorpe. I love the relentless uh, enthusiasm and optimism here. We've gone through our mock draft so far. We've only gotten three picks through, but I'll tell you what, this would be draft night gold right now. What we just heard uh, as as real analysis on the draft. He's got. For David, he's got uh, Evan Mobley going one uh, to uh, Detroit Pistons. He's got Scotty Barnes going two to the Houston Rockets. Kate Cunningham going three. I have a kind of a, a little bit in reverse order with Kate Cunningham going one, Evan Mobley going two, Scotty Barnes going three. But we do have the same top three, which, we do. Is, which is pretty cool. And, and yep. we're some of the few people that have the same top three. I'll also point out John Hollinger has that same uh, uh, top three, though we'll all pretty deviate now. All right, Toronto Raptors are on the board. I know you know Masai well. Uh, I, I know that you've known him really his entire career, uh, and uh, you know you you've been in each other's lives a lot. I've also got to know Masai before he was really even doing NBA scouting uh, back when it was the the Africa 100 uh, you know camp back in the day. He's on the clock here at four. Interesting spot for the Raptors to be in because they're probably better than the fourth pick in the draft, you know, typically as a team right now. So, you know, what, what are you going to do here? Uh, It looks like they're going to lose Kyle Lowry uh, in free agency. There's just too many teams. New Orleans uh, Pelicans just made a trade today to clear enough cap space to make a huge, huge offer at Kyle Lowry. And it looks like that's, that's the direction they're going. What do you do if you're Messiah for? Well, in terms of philosophy, I think we all agree that you almost always have to look at the value of the pick you know, the, the way to win in the NBA is you want to pay as a, as, a, as a team way less than what their real value is, right? So LeBron James is still a discount compared to what he returns. Same thing with, with rookies that in year two, year three, year four are much more valuable than what you're paying them, right? Think about Dante DiVincenzo with the Bucks uh, and many others. So you got to take a guy that you think has that high, high level of value. And so I think Jalen Green's a great pick for them. I also think, and I'm proud to say this, yeah, I... I first met Masai when he was still playing overseas 
And I think I'm the first person to kind of hire him when he first came here. He always says I am. Uh, he he trained players with me. He was training Kevin Martin with me and Udonis and Josh Josh Powell, who played for the Lakers years later, whatever. Masai was here for the summer. I My first pros were Nigerian guys that he sent me who played in Europe. And um, and so, yeah, he and I go back since long. He had a gigantic kid and play cut back then. It's very different now. So I think he is really uh, bought into player development. They invest a lot of time and resources. He and I have talked a lot about it. Uh, I think Jalen Green is absolutely lost as a player, like almost every freshman is, but he didn't even play freshman. They played how many games? 10 games, whatever, in the, in the G League bubble? 13. It was, I think it was like 13, 16, Was it 13? Yeah. I'll just say this, Chad. So the, this last couple of weeks, I've been really last week diving in. I'm watching international, high-level games internationally in the Turkish League, and you can guess the leagues I've been looking at. College basketball, the highest level of college basketball, and then the G League showcase, which I watched the showcase very closely. I had clients playing in it. So I saw Jalen and Kaminga play live in for the Ignite, and it was garbage compared to what those the international teams run, which is high-level tactics. Uh, the college teams, which are, I wouldn't call it high level, but they are running something. The G League team was get the ball to green, get out of the way, next guy up. It was almost like the Miami Heat when Wade and LeBron first teamed up. Your turn, your turn, your turn. Maybe they'll pass, maybe they won't. I feel badly for those two guys. And nothing against Brian Shaw, whatever. It did not work out well in terms of player development and give them the foundation. So I think green is far away from helping you win games. That being said, I think he's got a. I think he's got a little bit of quicker Zach Levine side. Like he's quicker than Zach. Uh, he 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 did a spin move and got fouled. It was a single. He didn't score it. It was the single best highlight I saw of all. I watched 15, 17 guys. It was the best play. He didn't score. He just got fouled on it. Full speed, three sixty spin without breaking stride. That's very very almost impossible to do. He's a really special athlete with length. He's got scoring instincts. He doesn't really know how to pass yet, but he threw, he made some nice passes that were very obvious to see, I thought, but at least he made them. I think he needs some work. I think the Raptors have a perfect environment for him. And if he doesn't get the right environment, Chad, I, I worry about his future as a great player. Most players need their franchise to help. We've seen that time and again. And I think the Raptors and Jalen Green are a perfect fit. One of the things that I'll, I'll say that, uh, had Brian Shaw sort of sell me on on Jalen Green, and if you if you're a podcast listener and you haven't listened to the podcast where I had Brian Shaw on the show, uh, breaking down the games of of all the G League Ignite players that are in the draft, and hear him tell stories about about Jalen Green, it was it was clear that there was a drive in Jalen Green, the d- desire to get better, the asking the questions, the staying after to break down tapes, uh, you know, wanting to be involved and understanding what they were doing and why that really impressed coach Shaw. And, and you know, he's trying to think the game and, and to your point, he's not there yet. Um, but if the effort's there and he's yep. going to put in the effort and not just rely on what is incredible athleticism, but actually is going to study the game and figure out how to get better the sky's really the limit for him because he he's just so talented. I think he'll figure out how to defend. I think he'll figure it out, uh, you know, how to get others involved better uh, if he's really going to become a student of the game. And that was one of the things that I think Brian Shaw liked about him as well as the competitiveness. I went a little bit different way with Toronto, again, controversial and took Jalen Suggs here. Uh, I, I know how much Masai loves toughness. I know how much Masai loves the guy that is going to go and and cut out your throat on the other end. And of all the players that I watched, you know, this year, there was something about the way that Jalen Suggs carried himself on the court that just just wowed me um, as a basketball player. Uh, it and and you know the thing that was so interesting about him to me was he scored when he needed to score. He got others involved when that was what he needed to do. He always showed up on the defensive end. Uh, he would turn it up right at the right time when he needed to. Uh, you know, even though he was in a very, very, very talented Gonzaga team where he was the freshman and had very experienced players all around him. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I don't like to throw around winner. I think it's a cliche. Uh, I don't like like to throw around the quarterback stuff or the defensive back stuff or you know all the sort of things that we say um, about Jalen Suggs. 
but there's some in in his approach to the game that reminds me a bit of Damian Lillard and how he sort of approaches the game that gets me really really excited. I don't think he has the athletic upside of Jalen Green. I don't think he'll be the scorer that Jalen Green is. I think his game is more well-rounded uh, right now than Jalen Green is, and he knows what he's doing a little bit more. Um, sure. But that's why that's why I had uh, Jalen uh, Suggs there um, at four. All right, we're in Orlando now. Uh, you're back home. You're in Florida. The Magic have picks five and eight. Uh, they're in a complete rebuild. Uh, right now, Jonathan Isaac's probably the best piece they have around them if he can ever get healthy. Yeah. Markel Fultz still showing, you know, signs of that guy that we saw sometimes as the number one pick, but just not, never quite has been able to get back to what we thought we were going to get there. A um, number of other sort of young players on this roster, RJ Hampton, Cole Anthony, we could go on and on. But, but you know, really, they're still missing that star. Uh, to build around here. Who do you have them taking at five? You made the argument. Uh, uh, my pick for the Magic is Suggs, although I would tell you now I would, I'd, be, I'd be willing to trade down and take another point guard that we'll get to later if, if we could do that. Uh, I like – I mean, I, and I like Cole Anthony. Uh, and Fultz can play on or off the ball. But uh, I like Suggs for the Magic for all the reasons you said. Uh, you said it for Toronto – uh, he's got to learn to shoot, but he probably will. Uh, there's no reason to think he won't learn to shoot better. Uh, and if you compare him to Lillard, it means he's really got to be able to shoot because that dude can really shoot. Uh, I, I, I think the magic, I mean, Jonathan Isaac is a, is a tragic story. He's so alive, and but he's not healthy because uh, I think he can be an, one of the best defensive players in the world. Suggs, to me, is a no-brainer. Uh, it allows them to, you can start Fultz with them because I think Suggs probably comes in and, and starts for a team that isn't going to win anyway. And then, and then develop Cole Anthony to be a nice backup. I, I think he's got a chance to be a good player. Like, we need – you need depth, right? The Jazz played nine every game this year pretty much uh, and then just were hurt in the playoffs and they didn't get out past the second round. If I personally think if Conley and Mitchell didn't get hurt, I think they were the best team in the league. They played – they went nine deep. Every game, the ninth guy played 16-plus minutes or so in George Niang. So depth matters. So draft Suggs, give him the ball – uh, I think he is cutthroat. I think he's got some – I compare him more to Drew Holiday than anyone else. I mm. coached Drew in the draft. You you saw him in my gym. Yeah, I, I went and watched him pre-draft working out in your gym as you got yeah. him ready for the draft. He was just a power forward in a point guard's body. He was 18 years old. And I think Suggs has a lot of that. He is just mm. this very strong defensive – we need defenders to win games. I think this guy defends – he doesn't defend a lot of positions, but you know what? Uh, I've never seen people guard Booker the way Holiday did. All right? First, he guarded Chris Paul and shut Paul down. Uh, but when they really need him to guard Booker, he stripped Booker two different times clean. That's pretty rare. I think Suggs has similar talent. So Orlando would be thrilled to get him. But like I said, if, if they got an offer to trade down three or four spots, I would do it and take a different guard that I'll get to later. But if they don't, I would, I would take Suggs. I believe it was the Kings that had the fourth pick in the draft that year, and you were begging the Kings to take – Drew Holiday um, at four. I think he ends up sliding to 16th, 16th right? Yeah. 16th or something yeah. in the draft. Yeah. Uh, you were begging them to take uh, to take him. And uh, as as often is the case, uh, David laid this out right. And I, I'm glad he had the opportunity to be everything he could be in Milwaukee. It, it, he's, yeah. he's had some tough situations as yes. far as the teams that he's been playing for. And, and I think he's been underrated as a player uh, in part because he's ju just the situations that he's been in. So you put him in the highest level of a situation like that. And um, I, I, I thought he was, you know, fantastic. And the, um, and, and the lob to Giannis. Yeah. Um, wow. Right. Uh, one, of, one of the greatest plays I've, I jumped out of my couch I too. when, I, I, when I saw that play. I did too. Just like I jumped when he blocked, when, uh, when Giannis uh, blocked the lob. Uh, who do you have going to Orlando? I had Jalen Green. So you oh, know, that's we're, right. We're, that's right. Yeah, we're just we're just we're just we're we're pretty much in sync. We're just switching we guys well, around I, a little bit. I here. do read you, Chad, and I do read John. And as much as I try not to be influenced by you guys, I am. I'm I'm following what you guys are writing, and I'm watching games. And if I have a guy, I, there's a couple of guys I probably have much higher than you had in your mock. We'll get to that. But so far, these guys are 
we're all in the same world a little bit, you know? And, and I think the NBA is in the same world on this. Yeah. I think these are going to be the five guys. Maybe the order is going to be a little bit different, but this is, this is generally where we're at. All right. So now things get interesting because we got Oklahoma city sitting there at six, uh, Sam Presti's on there. There's Jonathan Kaminga sitting there. Uh, and then a whole host of other, you know, prospects, because I think this next tier to me is, is sort of why there's a number of different prospects that I think you could make an argument for. I'm here. I'm really curious to see who you're going to advocate for, for the thunder at six. So I think because they have so – we know they can't draft everyone, right? And I go way, way back, decades with Sam Presley. We, we, they can't draft everyone. So I think when, when he's drafting, he's got to be thinking about also, are these, how, can these guys do something that adds value to them if I want to move them? And, uh, I, I, and so I think that kind of colors my, my opinion some. I almost had Kaminga there. I almost had another guard there, and I ended up going with Book Knight from Connecticut. Okay, I, uh, I which, think which he's... may very well be the pick. They like him for sure. Yeah. So that oh, is that right? Oh, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't read any of those things. Um, he is he's the closest thing to Jordan Clarkson in this draft, and Jordan Clarkson is my least favorite player to watch in the league, and he's also the best player in the league. That's my least favorite player to watch. He's a scoring monster. You cannot guard Jordan class. You just have to be missing shots. He's an amazing shot creator at the rim. He's more athletic than you realize and shooting it. I think Book Knight is so similar and super long, high level score. Uh, can play next to Shea, but you can bring him off the bench, which I think is just fine, especially early in their career. Uh, I think he's a really special scorer. Uh, uh, those guys are hard to find. The real scorers are hard to find. I think that's a great analogy, but also shows where we've hit a bit of a cliff in the draft. We've been talking about all yeah. these other comps, and then we just hit a Jordan Clarkson comp. Yeah, at right. So, so um, yeah. you know, there's there's a shift there. Uh, I like I like Book Knight. Uh, he wasn't my choice there. Kaminga was my choice there. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit of the Sam Hinky philosophy that you only have so many darts at the board, so you take the biggest ones and hope they stick. If Kaminga yeah. hits, he hits big. Uh, he also has a scary floor. There's scenarios yep. that I see where he's a miss. Uh, yep. But I, I think at this point, Oklahoma City has got to start thinking about getting a hit. Shea is, you know, amazing. A, 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 is amazing. Amazing. Everybody else on that roster is interesting at best, yes. uh, right? And so take that swing. You have time to develop them. That's my argument. I don't know where what and what Kaminga is going to be. I don't know, but I see the physical tools uh, that are there and it intrigues me. And if, you know, he's 18 and, and maybe with some really good development, he, he turns into something. I, I know his interviews have actually been pretty good uh, in talking to some teams and, and that they've been impressed with him. And so, you know, let's see, see what happens there. So that's Chad, six. Chad, yeah. I spoke, I spoke to some G league players about him back with, when they were playing in the showcase mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, they thought he was a terrific talent, like physical, strong, 18 year old, like they were very high in his upside. They understood the downside, not like you and I do because they're players, but these were really good veteran NBA guys that had fallen out of the NBA, were in the G League. They were really impressed with him. And by the way, I have him going to Golden State at seven. All right, so Golden State at seven. <laughs> Anything else that you want to say about him at, yeah. uh, with Kaminga? Part of my thinking is, I feel like Book Knight, Oklahoma City has so many young guys still, and they still got to develop Shea more. Like he has a chance to be a real, a real All Star, All NBA type talent. And so, I, you don't I, want to be I, developing Poku and yeah, and right, that at the same time. Oh, and, you know, and they have Lou Dort, who I like a lot too. But it's just, yeah. I think, I think Book Knight, they just turn him loose, let him figure it out as a scorer, mm -hmm. which I think he'll be able to do. And whereas Golden State, I reject any idea that they're drafting for this year. In fact, uh, I, I even made this argument about Weissman, who was coming along before he got hurt last year, which was really sad. I really thought we were start because I was super high on Weissman a year ago. I still am. Uh, I think Kaminga, let him play in the G League the whole year. Move him up on occasion here and there. Let him earn it. And and Golden State's got to be thinking. It's a mistake to, to think this draft solves any, unless you trade picks, which is different. If they can trade Weissman and these guys for Beal, that's a different argument. But absent that, develop your core nine regardless of who you draft here because they're not going to help you win games that matter. 
And so treat these other guys in a different team. They're your future team with Wiseman as long as you have them. Let them play in the G League a bunch. Really invest in development coaches, whatever. And if any team can do that, I think Golden State has a chance with both Draymond and Steph as leaders. I think Kaminga would do really well in that culture. I was really skeptical that Golden State would take Kaminga if he was there, but I've been corrected uh, in that thinking. I've had people in Golden State tell me that if he's there, there's a very high likelihood that they'll select him, and that's exact. They'll do exactly what what you said there, and 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 they'll have a ton of my respect uh, for that as well because it's so easy to say we're going to take Davian Mitchell here or you know yeah. someone who we think is going to be yeah. able to step in right away, <laughs> and instead say no, we're going to use Kaminga and Wiseman. Uh, you know, maybe Jordan Poole a little bit, and we're gonna we're gonna let these young guys figure it out, and we're we're thinking about sustainability as a franchise, while at the same time trying to compete for a championship. And uh, you know, so many teams sacrifice sustainability for for the moment. Yeah, and I, I think it's a very mature way of thinking about it as well, because as you and I know, you absolutely have to go for it if you're a team. But you, the Utah Jazz are just a great example of a team that did everything right and then has two unfortunate injuries right. at the exact wrong moment and, and they're out and their general manager, you know, or, or, uh, you know, is, right. is gone now. Uh, right. right. The yep. Giannis was a hyper extension away of yep. the Milwaukee Bucks, not winning uh, the title. Kawhi Leonard goes out and, and wrecks and right. wrecks the champ chances for the Clippers. The Nets right. were wrestling, uh, you know, with a number of energy uh, injuries. There's so many things that sort of can happen. And if you put all of your eggs in that basket and then one thing goes wrong, sometimes out of your control, now your franchise is decimated for right. uh, a decade. And so the maturity of the Warriors at taking that approach to me, I, I, I really, I really respect that. Uh, I had them doing something uh, insane. And so I'll, I'll get your response to this, which is, Alpern and Singun uh, out, yeah. out of Turkey, who I've wrestled with all year. At first, I didn't like him. I'm like, the NBA doesn't play that way anymore. Uh, you know, he's an old school center. You know, show him, show him to me 15 years ago, and I would have loved him, but, you know, not now. And then the more I watched the tape, the more I dove into the analytics, the more I began to get wrap my arms around the fact that an 18-year-old won the MVP of the Turkish League uh, and, and what that means because that's a good league. Folks, it's a good league. You know, for pe people that are wondering, like, that's a good league. Uh, 18 year olds don't win the MVPs in the NBA, uh, right? And they don't win them in the Turkish league. That's no. not, that's not, that's unprecedented there as well. That this guy is such an offensive genius at, at that I think that in the Warrior system, he's probably the unique prospect that's only 18 years old. But given the high level that he played at at Turkey and given how much of a, a savant he is as an offensive player, you can probably put him on the floor with Draymond. Draymond can can help with some of the, def the defense, yeah, defensive deficiencies that are there. Which is your concern. And, That's your yeah, concern. Which is a super big concern. Fourth quarter defense, yeah. Uh, but you've got Draymond Green, one of the best defenders uh, in, in, yeah. in the front court there right. next to him. I'm not even sure you play him in the fourth quarter, but he actually might weirdly be a guy who can help get you buckets that aren't three pointers uh, in, in the in in right away, uh, and and he still has the upside of being an 18 year old playing in a system where I think the Warriors would also develop him as a shooter, as a passer, yeah. uh, and not just ask him to sort of go around and bang in the post like they did in Turkey. This is my sort of thinking about that. Um, what what do you think about Sengun there? Yeah, I've got him uh, in our in my lottery. He's a little bit lower, uh, just because there's some other good players too. But uh, no, I, I evaluate him. I'm I'm a little concerned about his lack of mobility and the way the league is playing. Jokic is is bigger. He's just a a gargantuan yeah, individually, and so Jokic he's learned to be a good rim protector. Uh, whereas this guy, I'm, I mean, he needs to learn. He needs to learn to play like Marcus All. He's not as tall as Marcus All. He's not the presence Mark is. Uh, he's not the presence Brooke Lopez is physically. Uh, he's got to try to be to be able to stay on the court because, and even in the fourth quarter in the finals, Brooke didn't play. Uh, Coach Bud did a great job of using Brooke, but not in the fourth quarter. So, um, yeah, I think he's he's a brilliant offensive player. Uh, uh, has got a lot of work to do defensively, but he's he's to me he's a worthwhile lottery pick. I just want to have him in that spot. Fair, fair enough for the guy that took Scotty Barnes at two because yeah. of the great defense that he play, plays. Yeah. That he's not just going right. to be swayed by the offense. I love that. You know, you know what Sengun needs to do, David. What? 
He needs to eat more built bars. <laughs> that's what it, that's what he needs because look, they're delicious. I don't know if Alpern Sinkins ever had a built bar before, <laughs> um, but, but they're amazing. And I, I don't know what flavor he likes, but there's coconut, coconut, almond, cherry, raspberry, mint, brownie, peanut butter, brownie, double chocolate, salted caramel, something for everybody. But here's the reason that I say Alpern and Sinkin might need to eat some built bars. They have 17 grams of protein, uh, which is great. It can get stronger. 130 calories. Only four grams of sugar, so they're not bad for you. Only four grams of net carbs. Uh, they're they're delicious. I'm telling you, Built Bar sent me out a bunch of Built Bars. I had to fight my kids off from them because they taste like a candy bar. I love the coconut personally. It tastes kind of like a Mounds Bar. It's delicious. Uh, and so, you know, maybe if your team drafts Alpern and Singen, what you need to do is order some Built Bars for him. You can get him raspberry, mint brownie. Maybe you should ask him at the press conference what he likes. So whatever he likes, go to BuiltBar.com. Use promo code LOCK15. You get 15% off your first order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at our great sponsor, who is also going to sponsor our live YouTube streaming of the NBA draft. It's BuiltBar.com. All right. We, we are in an epic podcast right now. This is the thing about when David and I get a talking, like we're, we're actually moving fast. Uh, for the way that David and I would typically talk about that. We are cutting off topics way earlier than we typically would, but we kind of want to get through the lottery. We've gone through seven yeah. picks. The Magic are there, their second pick in the draft right now. Lots of different names getting thrown around uh, in Orlando right now. I think it's definitely definitely a spot that a lot of teams are looking at and saying, what's Orlando going to do? Book Knight is in that mix He's off the board uh, as well. Kaminga, yeah. I think, would be uh, you know in that mix as well. Who do yep. you select for them with the eighth pick in the draft? Uh, well, I like your thinking with uh, with uh, uh, Kaminga, but I already have him gone. So to me, it's just really hard to uh, develop two raw players at the same time. Uh, but they drafted Suggs in my fantasy world, and I, I think he's the I think he's literally the easiest guy next to maybe Cunningham too. Uh, uh, to to coach like I think he knows you know what you have with him so I'm going crazy here and taking the most athletic center in the draft Kai Jones all right okay this is big time the internet's about ready to explode David Thorpe we've all been freaking out that Charlotte might take Kai Jones at 11 David Thorpe takes Kai Jones at eight this is a big move Kai Jones obviously one of the most freakish athletic guys that you see at his size he moves like a guard he doesn't just run well yeah. or athletic for a big guy he runs and moves like a guard he showed some three-point shooting this year in texas but also david because i'm sure you watched that texas film and may you know especially if you watched old games there's times that you'd forget that this incredibly athletic incredibly athletically gifted player was even on the court at times yeah. uh, he doesn't really rebound that well he's not a great shot blocker um, seems like his feel for the game is a little bit behind. Uh, why take Kai Jones at eight? Because to me, he's like one of the biggest high high ceiling, or low floor guys in the draft. That's why, because they already have Suggs. That's number one. Number two, because okay. Suggs is a no-brainer. Number two, there's a Don't history they have Mo here. Bamba? Isn't Mo Bamba, wasn't Mo Bamba supposed to be that guy? He was, yeah, and he still might be. Like Big guys really very often develop so late. I don't like quitting on big guys at all. Uh, that's why I'm high on Weissman. No one projected Aiden in year three to be this DeAndre Aiden. He went number one, of course. But there's a history here at the number eight spot, too, and Texas. So a couple years ago, I wrote that, they, that the Pelicans should take Zion first. This isn't true. You can look it up. And, and there's, I think they have the number four pick. I suggested trade down. And I said, maybe you get to seven or eight, and you can take a kid named Jackson Hayes, and that'll give you the most athletic four and five in the league. It's going to take a while for Zion and Hayes to learn to play together. But I thought that could be their future. And I told this to David Griffin afterwards. I don't think David Griffin took my advice. But he did do that. He traded he did, did down I think, with Atlanta and took Jackson Hayes at eight. And I was uh, just texting with some Pelicans people. They're still very high on him. He, he, is an un he is a breathtaking athlete. And so is this young man. So again, Orlando is building for the future. They've got a kid in Suggs that, yes, they have to develop and coach him. Of course they do. But in my fantasy world where they drafted him, they can go ahead and swing for the fences. And if he doesn't work out, they Suggs still did. You still got one of two. But if you really develop players the right way, Chad, you shouldn't miss on any of them. They may not reach their ceiling. Maybe he's never worth the number eight pick. But he should, he should be a serviceable player. Uh, this kid that has such upside in this league, 
as I said before with my first pick in Mobley, you've got to get guys that can guard 30 feet and 35 feet from the rim and then right at the rim. And there's just very few men on the planet can do it. This young man is someone that can be able to do that down the road. All right. I love it. It's bold. I also went bold at eight uh, and also went for them to swing for the fences, but in a different way for Zaire Williams uh, out of Stanford. Uh, You probably think right now, if you just watch a Stanford film, Chad's an idiot. Chad has no idea what he's talking about. No, I got him. Ugly ugly game film. Uh, it, he struggled at Stanford, but when you go watch him in high school and then you look at all the circumstances and you talked right. about this before in the podcast that it's, it's really unfair to judge any of these young yep. men, but Zaire Williams had a, an even more unique set of circumstances or that were, that were surrounding him at the time. 6'10", very bouncy athletically, excellent ball handler, a, and a, a good shooter that could end up being a great shooter. Yep. He's not great yet, but he could be. Uh, you're talking about, you know, the prototypical, you know, wing in the NBA and a guy that was ranked this high um, by by not just me or high school groups, by NBA scouts before yeah. his at the start of his season at Stanford. Uh, I know that he's worked out well for the for the Magic. I, I will say this. Both of our picks reflect something I think we know about Jeff Weltman and John Hammond, which is they don't care what anybody else thinks. Uh, they are going to take swings. Um, they've done it all the time. Sometimes those swings don't, you know, work out exactly the way I'm thinking of Thon Maker, uh, you know, for example, or what have you. But then times like Giannis, when they hit, they, they hit big. And yeah. and I think Jonathan Isaac was another one of those swings. Yeah. And, you know, one of those guys that, you know, barring injuries probably does hit yeah. uh, big. And so here's two, uh, you know, big swing options for them uh, sitting at eight. All right. It's nine. It's Sacramento. You once the gave them the great athletic. advice to draft Drew Holiday. They didn't listen to you. I'm, so <laughs> who uh, should they draft now? I'm just sick of teams only drafting for offense. And uh, the most athletic player in this draft is Keon Johnson. I think we can agree on that mm-hmm. uh, from Tennessee. Uh, watching tape, his his defensive instincts were second to Barnes of all perimeter-based defenders this mm-hmm. year. Uh, I thought. I loved what I saw from Keon. He doesn't, he doesn't know how to play yet. They're freshmen. But his instincts, and again, instinct is something you can learn. Our instinct is to touch a flame when we're one. By the age of two, they don't touch flames anymore. You know, you have a lot of kids. Right. That you learn those instincts. Johnson has instincts now defensively that get him started. He's such an athlete. The Kings, I love him with Fox. I love that athleticism at the one, two, one, three spot. Um, uh, with Halliburton, and you go two guards plus Johnson, uh, I think it's a chance to be a special defender, great in transition, uh, with an upside offensively, obviously, with that kind of athleticism. But unlike uh, Gerald Green, for example, that couldn't really play, he could just jump. Uh, he right. never guarded. I think this guy can guard and will buy into it because uh, it's kind of his, in his nature. And I think he'd be a good pick for them. You know, the interesting thing is like a month ago, that would not be a wild take at all. Like Keon Johnson was sort of in that range. He's He's been, I don't want to say inexplicably sliding in the draft. I think this is what happens when you bring these young men in to do workouts, which have yeah. probably been heavier this year than others and his feel for the game isn't quite there yet so he's put in situations that may make him sort of uncomfortable and he struggles a little bit and and like you said a lot of times great defensive players don't show right. as well especially if it's just in the drill section now sometimes when they get into those two on twos and three on you threes yeah. yeah guys can guys can really start to hang their hat on that and and i know guys that have gotten drafted just by shutting down everybody that 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 you know that comes in uh, I think that's absolutely a defensible pick. I also went defense for the Kings. And by the way, I think we both agree that the worst defensive team, not only in the league last year, but I think historically, they were one of the worst defensive teams in NBA history last year. Uh, I have them taking Franz Wagner, who's a who's a wing forward, uh, who I, I am really impressed with his defense and his ability to move his feet, to, to guard twos, threes, and fours in the league. And he's a little bit further along offensively than, than Keon Johnson. He's not a great offensive player, uh, but he's got the makings of being a really solid uh, you know, offensive player. He can shoot the three. He can handle the ball a little bit. It's a secondary ball handler. Uh, I don't think, again, you draft 
you know, Franz Wagner to be a 20 point a night scorer right. in the NBA. Uh, but, you know, if you look at his assist and her, his, excuse me, his steal and block block rates, uh, you know, for a forward, they were terrific. Good. And, yeah. and he gave your boy, Scotty yeah. Barnes, he played uh, great. He, he, he uh, against Scotty Barnes, who is no easy cover. No. Uh, he really, I thought did a great job on Scotty Barnes in the NCAA tournament. So that's, that's my select. Uh, yeah. Pick yeah. Michigan was terrific. That game. I, that's probably the only guy you have that I don't have in my lottery. Uh, Wagner on tape to me came off as a little bit soft, actually, which is not something I tend to say about players at that level. Uh, it may just be, uh, I don't know. I have no bias against him. That's for sure. Uh, I really not him. even after he gave Scotty Barnes. A no, hard time I don't. Yeah, I, don't yeah. <laughs> I can, I can wear multiple hats and always have been able to, uh, I, I liked him in that game. I, I was, in fact, I thought, uh, their coach was phenomenal. I thought that he was an incredible coach that, Juwan Howard is amazing to me. Um, I just don't love him, but whatever. Uh, I get, I mean, you, we're both thinking the same thing. The Kings, don't talk about defense until you start drafting it. Like, I'm a big, I don't like it when 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 you always talk about defense the regular season, but you never draft guys that really want to guard. Uh, and so I think we both are thinking the same thing, that they got to get some guys that that want to guard. Otherwise, you're still going to be bad on defense, probably. Uh, so All right, let's uh, real, real quick on for Memphis, at 10, I've got um, your guy, Williams. I've got Zaire Williams. Yeah, I, I liked everything you said. I thought I thought he's got a great chance to be uh, Mikhail Bridges, maybe a little better. Mm. Uh, That's uh, what everybody I mean, wants right now. That's yeah, what they're, they're right. trying to sell Trey Murphy and a number of other players. This is the guy that everybody wants sort of in this range is uh, he, the next he moved, without, he moved without the ball. I think your point, I've listened to all your pods about Stanford are great. Uh, it's unfair to, to evaluate him. He is more athletic on tape than I realized at first, uh, really a special athlete, uh, but move it out the ball and, and looks like he can shoot. Uh, he's going to gain some strength and, and his length will help you defend. So Memphis is Memphis has got, they're doing a good job. Like they've not been well run uh, way in the past. In the last six, seven years with John was there and now they're, they're doing some good things, Chad. I, and of course, John Morant's a no brainer, but I, I like, I like the fit there for what they're building. They have a lot of depth. They have a lot of talent. They, uh, you know, they, they absolutely uh, have been one of the best drafting teams yeah. the last few years. Um, and for those listeners that are saying, why are we talking about Memphis at 10? Uh, there was a trade on Monday with the Pelicans and, and Memphis. Uh, Steven Adams goes, Eric Bledsoe goes uh, to Memphis. Uh, Jonas Valanciunas uh, comes up uh, to New Orleans. They swap 17th and 10th picks. They swap 40 and 51 uh, as well. And so now Memphis has this attend. Everybody's sort of arguing where they're going to go. Now, this is uh, actually in my actual mock draft where I have Zaire uh, going right now is to Memphis. So this is not in my personal mock draft, but what I'm sort of reporting right now, they're after Wagner is from everything that I can, that, that I'm hearing that that's who they're after. Again, analytics folks love Wagner. That's just, I think yeah. one of the, one of the reasons the Kings are on him as well. Analytically, when you have a high steal rate and a high block rate, this, it's one of the things time. that's going to really make you pop on an analytic, yeah. uh, on an analytic spreadsheet. Uh, Zion's there. Josh Giddy's another guy that um, they're, they're clearly looking for kind of a playmaking wing uh, right now and and a guy that also can defend multiple positions there. Uh, at 10, I think that I had um, Davian Mitchell. Uh, I can't remember uh, exactly now because it was it was to New Orleans now, but Davian right. Mitchell there. Let's talk about Mitchell for a minute. I can see by the look on your face, maybe I, you're not that excited on Davian. No, no, Mitchell. no. Just the opposite. He's he's my next pick. For okay, Charlotte. he's your next pick. Yeah. Um, I I historically shun all older prospects. I I'm a believer in the idea that you probably should not take a guy that's 22 or older in the lottery. The history of them over the last decade is pretty abysmal. Uh, that there's a reason that they're better than other prospects because they've been in college for three or four more years. As you know, that development is huge during that time. The difference between an 18 year old and a 22 year old is is significant. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and, and you can't just look at the numbers and they're not apples to apples, um, at that point. And look, most, because NBA scouting is so good, most of the talent is cleared out before then. So yeah. they, uh, you, if you're still playing college basketball, they, if an NBA scouts missed you for three years, there's probably a reason, uh, that, that they missed you. Uh, and, and so for all of those reasons, I typically don't do this, but Davian Mitchell to me is a guy that I, I think is, is, 
again, how he approaches the game defensively. Uh, I think he might be the best on the ball defender uh, as uh, from guards in the draft. Um, how he affects winning, uh, I think his ability to uh, to finish the basketball is 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 dramatically improved this year. I think that his shot dramatically improved this year. And I know there's some skeptics that say, you know, let's look at him historically how he shot, and let's look at this year. But he might be one guy. Uh, and Scott Drew's talked about this. You can improve shooting. I think you've you've made this argument many times that yeah. just because you're a bad shooter doesn't mean you can't get better. And everything that Scott Drew said about Davian Mitchell is that this guy is a gym rat who works over and over and over again. Uh, and because of that, you know, I think he may end up actually being the shooter that that he was at Baylor this year. I love him. I think he is a guy that actually can probably help you more than most prospects can right now, but I'm not just drafting him for that. I'm drafting him because I think he might have a Kyle Lowry S career. Uh, I, I career. compare him more to Jameer Nelson. I think he's a mm -hmm. clone of Jameer. I watched Jameer a lot in college. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't, re I probably don't remember anymore. Jameer was a very, very good player on both ends. You couldn't post Jameer Nelson, just like you can't post Kyle Lowry uh, quarterback of the team but could also score uh, uh, if they don't trade uh, Courtney Lee and they, and the magic don't uh, re and, and they re-sign Hito Turkoglu, the magic might be going to three or four straight NBA finals against Kobe and the Lakers. They went to one. Jameer was terrific. Uh, so I think I love Mitchell and I love him for Charlotte because you can play him with LaMelo and let LaMelo play off, learn to play off the ball, not just be so ball dominant. Uh, he can guard one. Lamelo is big enough to guard, obviously, you know, bigger guys. Uh, there is an attitude Mitchell has, right? There's an edge he brings that I think would help that franchise. I like their coach very much. They do have some upside to 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 uh, grow into with the right guy at, with with that kind of edge. I'm, I'm a, I really like Mitchell a lot. I want to correct myself. I went back and looked at my personal mock draft. I was misremembering mis James Book Knight I had here, which David had going six. Yeah. Oh man, Ja Moran and James Booknight together in the backcourt. That's uh, <laughs> that, that that'd be pretty good too. Uh, yeah. The one thing that's crazy about Memphis is you know they they have a, a really cohesive you know rotation, a five and, and yeah. a rotation that comes in. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit hard to figure out exactly how to improve them because you like kind of how at least I did kind of like how the pieces kind of fit together in Memphis. I actually do like Stephen Adams there. I, I actually thought that was a good good pickup for them. I think Steven Adams will be better in Memphis than he's going to, than he was uh, in New Orleans. Okay. I think it's a better fit. Yeah. Um, all right. Then Charlotte at 11, you just talked about, you have Davian Mitchell there. I had Keon Johnson there. And so we're not, you know, too far apart nope. there. So we've talked about both of those guys. Let's go to San Antonio at 12. I've got Sengun. I like, I okay. like their guards. I like, I think they do a great job with their bigs. Uh, they've turned Jacob Pertle into one of the best defensive players in the league. Uh, so I think the structure of how they teach – the San Antonio's defense wasn't great this year. It was okay. Uh, normally, it's obviously much better. I think their guard play uh, is outstanding, and one of the best ways they help bigs defensively is to have just better perimeter defenders. So not everyone's coming at them all the time. And with White and with Murray and Devin Vassell is going to be a terrific player, I think. Yeah, Johnson's I a very good defensive player. Uh, I think adding that kind of offensive firepower with Sengun is it – you have already gone, but I think the Spurs would be really good for him. I, I think I feel like that's going to be his floor and the actual yeah. draft. Like the Spurs passing on Sengun, just giving everything to three. It doesn't right. seem plausible. I mean, you, they might do it, uh, but I, I haven't gone, gone further anyway. I had them taking Jalen Johnson out of Duke. And God, we're so close here. Just wait because I have him uh, next. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to let you talk about Jalen Johnson because. I don't know what I'm doing with Jalen Johnson. All I know is when I started watching him in high school and watched those first couple of Duke games, I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy's going to be a top five pick in the draft. Then I watched other games and I'm like, oh, I don't know. Maybe he's not going to get drafted in the first round. And then he leaves Duke early and there's all this stuff that swirls around him. But a jumbo size playmaker uh, who is, is devastating in the open court, devastating when he's out in transition, but then his game starts to stagnate a little bit when you get in the half court game. And, and I just not exactly sure how you use him to use him as a small ball five. Like, you know, how do you use him? I'm curious. I'm curious how you would utilize Jalen Johnson and get the most out of him in the NBA. So uh, I, I have him going 13 of the Pacers. He's my least favorite of the, of the picks that I have. 
Uh, I do think there's a lot of crash and burn potential. Uh, I like Rick Carlisle, my friend, very much. Um, I think that the Pacers... Rick Carlisle will hate Jalen Johnson, man. Yeah. Well, he's not going to have a choice. <laughs> you you don't Johnson, like right? him if you gave him Jalen Johnson. He right. wants you to give him Chris Duarte he, he or, does. or Corey Gisbert. But I will tell you this about Rick. He is a tinkerer. He'll, he okay. won't tinker for long. He will tinker with you and your shot. And if it's not working out, he's moving on. And so there, so they'll trade him quickly if that's the case. But as a franchise, I love what they did with Miles Turner. I love what they did with uh, Demontis Sabonis. I don't think Turner is long for the franchise. I do think he's likely to be traded. And just like Memphis traded Valanciunas, you trade Turner coming off a high, had a good season shot, you know, block shots and all of that. So uh, Johnson, to me, I would just play him and then try to tweak what you're doing. I think too often – you want you don't want to put a, a ceiling on his game until you let him play with it. Uh, uh, Kevin Durant was able to do whatever the hell he wanted to do for PJ Carlisle in Seattle, and then they narrowed his focus a little bit, and then blew it back up when he grew as a player. DeAndre Ayton, same thing with Phoenix. He came in wanted to shoot threes and show off his skills, and then they narrowed his focus into a real big man. And I think they'll expand it out in time. Johnson needs that kind of focus from the Pacers, where let him fail because he'll fail. Let him play G League and fail there. And then, okay, you want to be a successful player, let's narrow your focus, let's get a couple of things done, and then build back up. And if they do that, I think he's a worthwhile pick at that at that, at that spot. Oh, the talent's there. Yeah. It's it's hard not to see the talent, whether he I mean, puts to it all together is a big, yeah. big question mark. Yeah. And uh, But at some point, it's hard to ignore the talent. I think that's kind of where both of us ended up. All right. Uh, I, had da- I had Davian Mitchell at 13. Uh, I think Rick Carlisle will like me a little bit better than you if I give him Davian Mitchell and you give him uh, Jalen yes, Johnson. But for but, sure, you know we'll we'll see. And I actually I think Jalen Johnson makes a lot of sense there. So let's let's end this at fourteen. Let's assume Golden State ke- keeps their picks. I know they're trading. They're trying to trade both of their picks. I don't think they've gotten an offer right now that is really enticing to them, which is why they've been doing these second workouts and what have you. Who's your last guy in the lottery? Again, so with the Warriors, I have them uh, thinking about the future. Obviously, these are not guys that are going to play for them this year very much. They'll be in the G League. Uh, having watched the Jazz play all season, Joe Ingles is a marvelous player, a, a really special talent, and one of the best shooters in the world off the dribble or the catch. Josh Giddy is a long way from that, let's be fair. But so was Joe Ingles when he, first, when he was this age. Uh, Giddy, uh, as a 6'8 guard, just like Kay Cunningham, uh, has a lot of upside as an offensive player, as a passer, as a scorer, as a ball handler, decision maker, pick and roll player. He just can't shoot yet, but he's a kid. He's a teenager. So I like I like that the Warriors thinking down the road. You got Giddy, you got Kaminga, you got Wiseman. In 2025, pretty damn sexy, right? If you're thinking that way. Wiseman may be able to help before those other two on this current team that's trying to win a championship. But Brewing, if you're really building a franchise for the long term while still trying to win with your free agents and certain current players, you got to be thinking, let's just keep it going. And those three guys, Kaminga, for me anyway, my fantasy world, Kaminga, Giddy, and Weissman, I like that core going forward. That's a beautiful future uh, for Golden State. I, I, I worry about the jump shot. I worry a little bit about yeah. uh, defensively his lateral mobility. Yep. Very slow. Uh, and whether that is going to affect him. The passing is is incredible. Uh, the way he sees the floor at his age is is absolutely remarkable. So I love that. I think he's just got to turn around one of those two. If he can be that sort of elite passer and lock, be a lockdown defender, I think he'll be fine in the league. Or if he can be that sort of passer and stretch the floor because he can shoot the basketball, I think he'll be fine. But I think he's going to need to pick up one or two of those other things. He can't yeah. just be a great passer. No. Uh, but he's 18 years old. Right. And so absolutely he could pick that up. I, I did I did something really different. I actually kind of like your way better, <laughs> to be what honest. I should have talked to you before I put this <laughs> together. I I mean, when you say, oh, Wiseman, and then uh, Kaminga. Uh, Kaminga, and then um, I Giddy. had Kaminga going ahead of him, but then yeah. Giddy, boy, that sounds really enticing to me. I had Singoon, and then I went Jared Butler. And I went I Jared, Butler. Jared Butler. I wanted to get him in the lottery. Just, I ran out of room. I love him. I, CJ McCollum. I was trying to split the difference here because Butler has three years at Baylor, has won a national championship, was the was the best player 
uh, you could argue on Baylor that year, but he's yeah. 20.9 years old. He's not even 21 years old yet. Yeah. Uh, he's really young for his class. And so a little bit like Singoon, trying to find younger players that actually have some experience under their belt. I definitely think Jared Butler could come in and play off the bench one and two for them. Uh, the way he shoots the ball, he's crafty, uh, getting to the basket. I think he he's not an elite defender. with He doesn't have elite length or elite, elite athleticism, but man, he goes after it. He tries to defend. Uh, and, and I just think he's an incredible young man. I'm cheering for him. Obviously, he was flagged by doctors uh, at the, you know, at the combine. And, you know, I think there's some concerns about his health, but I, I just thought Jared Butler would would be a guy that kind of gives you a little bit of the best of both worlds. But you went higher, you swung for the fences more. And if those guys all pan out, the Warriors are set for a really long time in the future where I, I kind of split the difference a little bit. I, I love Butler though. He's I watch him. I just keep being CJ McCollum from Lehigh. I just saw hmm. the same kind of player, really skilled offensive player, scoring, shooting, driving. Um, yeah, I'm a fan. Well, I know this is the longest podcast in the history of uh, Chad Ford's NBA Big Board. We're now exceeding Ryan Rossillo, uh, which is saying something here. But I want to ask you one more question okay? because I know you've looked at all these other guys. One guy that you didn't talk about that that you really like, uh, that, that we didn't talk about, didn't make the lottery, but David Thorpe thinks this guy is going to make and it can be butler if you want it to be but one guy that didn't make your lottery that david thorpe was watching tape on and said this guy's going to make it yeah well again i'll I'll be a homer because i saw him play every game and i'll remind you that florida state has four guys in his draft i don't like all four of them i like two barnes i love and i love raekwon gray i don't I, i i'm shocked he isn't a first round pick i understand he's overweight i don't care I had Dewan Blair lose 60 pounds when he was training with me, all right? 60, okay, when he left Pittsburgh. He should have been training with you because he he rolled into the, the combine with the highest body yeah, fat. Yeah, I, I have no idea what's going on. I, I wasn't looking to train, you know, my son's teammates, whatever. Um, uh, I watched him play every game. He's a point – he's P.J. Tucker 2.0. Uh, he's a, a stellar defensive player, Chad. He can play point guard on offense and distribute. Uh, and, and remember this, in college, it's a more physical game because the refs – tend to let things go. But anytime he sneezed, it was an offensive foul. He's so much bigger. At 6'8", 270, he's so much bigger. But in the NBA, he'll, he, they won't punish him the same way. He's very skilled as a ball handler. I think he's going to learn that he can score better than he realized in college. He finally kind of figured out later on he can really guard. That's my favorite thing about him. Very quick feet, very quick hands at 6'8 and long. I think he's going to be a long-term starter and I understand why you don't take him in the lottery. All these other guys can be long-term starters too. I think he's going to be the league. When you look at what's said and done, if there's 15, 20 guys from this draft, which is typical, I know you know that, he's going to be on that list and he'll be a starter more than a lot of them. That's what I think. I love it. David's been talking about Raekwon Gray to me all year. This isn't just something that, you know, that came up uh, off the top of his head. I love it. I, you know, I saw him playing the combine. He absolutely popped at times and other times – it wasn't just the right environment for yeah. him. And and yeah. I think the lack of conditioning uh, yeah. was clearly, you know, part of the issue for him as well. He's, he's ranked by everybody that I've talked to as a second rounder. David would take him in the fine. first. I love that. I would, but second round's fine. Whatever. I just think he's a worthwhile player to draft. He's his draft crush. Okay. Here's mine. I don't know if you've seen this guy, my draft crush, Sharif Cooper, out of Auburn. The little point guard that can get anywhere he wants on the floor is the most creative passer to me of anybody in the draft. His shot, uh, you know, he's going to struggle to finish over length uh, at the rim because he's little. But, you know, I had a I had an executive and I'm curious what you think about this kind of pull me aside the other day and say, you know, Chad, you got to let go of this idea that little guards can't play in the league anymore. There, there was, you know, that that was a common sort of way of sort of thinking in the league. You devalue little guards. Chris Paul is leading the Suns to the finals. He's not nearly the athlete that Chris Paul was, you know, 15 years ago, and he still can do and 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 impose his will on the game. He was getting shots off against Giannis uh, at times uh, in in the playoffs. Mike Conley, a little guard, led to the Utah Jazz to the best record uh, in the NBA. Kyle Lowry is uh, about ready to get another $30 million. He's in his mid-30s. Uh, he's a little guard. John ja Morant. Uh, John ja, ja Morant, though John ja Morant is a freak. Uh, yeah, he, <laughs> he, he doesn't play like a little guard. Yeah. Uh, I, I like Sharif Cooper. I know he can be wild, uh, but you know anybody that can get 
to wherever he wants on the floor and can get the, the ball to whoever he wants uh, on the floor is going to be an intriguing player for me. And just the energy level just rose in me every time that that young man was out on the court. I really want to see him succeed. What do you think of Sharif Cooper? Yeah, I love him. Uh, I, I saw, maybe I was wrong on this because I, I don't know if I saw as much passing as you, but uh, this year, Terry Rozier, Rozier was one of the best offensive players in the league. He was a phenomenal mm-hmm. offensive player. I think Cooper has a chance to be like that. I did consider him for all these picks. Um, the league, I've written about this, Chad, as everyone spreads out to guard the three, what I call that second box, I even did a diagram because we teach it in our gym, is wide open. You've got those little quick guys that can beat helpers to the spot because you've already beat the guy in the perimeter when he contested your shot. The quick guy to get in the lane, shoot it before you know it with a floater. Trey Young does this all the time. Booker does this all the time. They're a huge value. Conley was maybe the most valuable guard. Uh, he wasn't the best player. on Donovan Mitchell was their most talented guy. Gobert, the most impactful. Conley was the second most impactful guy and one of the most impactful plus minus in the league. Now, he's experienced, okay? So little guys have to really know how to play, but Cooper's got great upside. I, I like him very much. He's David Thorpe. He's at truehoop.com. Go get, go get their newsletter. Check it out. It's amazing. David, this has been a really fun podcast. This has like been one of my favorite podcasts of the whole year. I'd love just talking hoops. Uh, I love that my listeners got some unique perspectives on some of these prospects right now. Hopefully some of their minds are, are, are turning a little bit now thinking about these prospects in different ways. Always a pleasure. And I think people are going to come back and look at this podcast and say, Oh, David Thorpe, Raekwon Gray. I love Let's it. So. Thank you so much, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Be good. Be safe. All right. Well, uh, good luck on Thursday. I know you won't get much sleep. Yeah, not much sleep, but for again, Thursday's the big day. Just a reminder again, check us out on live on YouTube, Locked On NBA. Uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're going to be live for every pick in the draft. Uh, you're going to have just, I think, great analysis. All of our Locked On hosts are going to come in, and Rafael Barlow, who's been on the podcast and just amazing, to me, a very much a young and up-and-coming talent as far as a talent evaluator goes, is going to be with us as well. Uh, go over to Locked on NBA YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to our channel. We're going to have great podcasts all week. Tony Jones is going to come on. We're going to do draft grades at some point. I'm going to go through my final mock draft on here later this week as well. Just so much content over at NBABigBoard.com. You've been listening to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board on the Locked On Podcast Network. Aloha.